Come on in, pull up a chair and take a load off because today I'll be reviewing Atlantic Chase from GMT Games. Is this an excellent war game tackling the early years of the battle for the Atlantic during World War II? Or if you buy this, are you going to feel like you're simply chasing your tail trying to learn the rules to it? Well, you're going to find out right after this. Howdy, 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 gang. Welcome once again to the Duct Tape Studios. I'm Jeff McAleer, your host here at the Gaming Gang channel. As I mentioned in the open, I'm going to be reviewing Atlantic Chase in just a moment. But first, I want to once again thank everybody out there for all the kind thoughts and prayers they've sent my way regarding my recent triple bypass surgery. It's been six weeks since the surgery. I just wrapped up my first week of cardiovascular rehab. All the doctors and nurses are giving me a big thumbs up and telling me I am way ahead of the curve. So, all good. So, once again, thank you so much for those kind thoughts and prayers. They really do mean a lot to me. So, today I am going to be reviewing Atlantic Chase from GMT Games. It is designed by Jeremy White with graphic design by Jeremy White. It is for one or two players, ages 14 and up. Plays in 30 minutes or more, quite a bit more, depending on which scenario you're playing. It does carry an MSRP of $69. So let's swing on over to the other camera because here I've got the board for Atlantic Chase laid out. It was all the components. But before we dive in, a couple of things. First off, the fine folks over at GMT Games were kind enough to provide me with this review copy but neither I nor anyone else affiliated with the gaming gang has received any other sort of compensation for me to share my thoughts about this game with you. These days, it's important that you know that. Second thing, I am not gonna get into a big how to play for Atlantic Chase. This is a rather complex design, although thankfully the way the rules are presented makes it much easier to learn how to play the game. But there's a lot going on. There is a lot to unpack in this game. So I'm going to give a pretty high level kind of overview of the game and then discuss what I think of Atlantic Chase and who this game is going to be for. So one of the first things I want to mention is that when anybody opens up this game or they saw an unboxing, and I did a detailed unboxing on the Gaming Gang Dispatch. I'll put a link to it in the, the show notes if you'd like to check that out. First thing you'll notice is there's all these books. There are five books. It's like, holy cow. It's like, man, is how daunting a task is it going to be to learn how to play Atlantic Chase? And one of the first things that I noticed, because I, I didn't see a, you know, like designer book or uh, a lot of times we get that playbook from GMT, which is actually the first thing I always look at because I find it easier to learn how to play the game if I read the uh, playbook before I read the rule book. But as I jumped into this, it's showing the various different rules and they're in alphabetical order. Well, not yet, but we get some of the core concepts of the game, and then we start getting into the different actions that are available and the various different rules, and it's sort of like, wait a second, how do you learn how to play this game? Because it's not laid out like a traditional war game rule book. There's no um, case points or anything like that. It's all just like actions, initiative, like airstrikes. But one thing I also have to point out is that we've got loads and loads of images and examples as well to really facilitate learning this game. This is essentially the early years 
of the Battle for the Atlantic. So it's 1939 to 1942. If you're playing it as a two-player game, you are essentially looking at the Germans versus the Allies, mainly the British. If you're playing solitaire, you are going to be leading the Kriegsmarine. So we've got the rule book, so it's like, holy cow. And then next, it's like, there's the advanced battle rules. It's like, wait a second, advanced rules too? So these are only used during the battles, which take place over on this portion of the board. But I got to be honest, I have not played the advanced battle rules, although they look really cool. They do strike me as uh, really adding a, a lot more detail to the battles because the reality with just the standard rules, the battles are pretty abstracted. So as you can see here, we've got special results, gunnery tables. We've got hit locations. So if uh, you are looking for far more detail in the combat, then you will definitely want to check out the advanced battle rules. I have read through them. Like I said, they look very interesting. I just had not used them. So we have the tutorial book. And this is where you're going to learn how to play Atlantic Chase. I got to point out, the books that come with this game are about as heavy as a standard GMT game box. In fact, there's so much packed into this, this box that... Uh, because of my surgery, I'm still supposed to only pick up five pounds or less. So every time I pick up this box, I actually got a break in that. So what will happen here is we've got these tutorials, and it's essentially just building blocks. You'll learn one thing, and then you get to learn something else that gets added to that. And then you learn something else, which gets added to that. And then you learn something else that gets added to that. And there are 10 tutorial missions, which some are just learn how to make a, tra a trajectory, which I'll talk about in just a moment. But very, very easy to get a grasp of what's going on in this game by going through the tutorials. We'll mention, if you are planning on playing Atlantic Chase as a two-player game, I would certainly recommend one of the players play through all of the tutorials, play a couple of solitaire scenarios to get a feel for what's going on, and then loan the game to the other player. Because this is not an easy game to explain to somebody else how to play. It really is not. The best way to learn is each player gets to play through these tutorials as well. So just kind of once again, show you, we've got all of these different examples. So very, very nicely done. So of course, as you can see, the game board here is the North Atlantic, mainly the North Atlantic. So we got solitaire scenarios. We got a bunch of solitaire scenarios here. And as I mentioned before, if you are playing solitaire, then you are effectively the German Admiral, Admiralty. Why did I have a hard time getting that word out? Kind of weird. So one of the cool things about each of the scenarios is because you'll have like a bot. It's going to tell you, okay, so what is the allied bot going to do? What is the allied player doing? And depending on the scenario, a lot of these things change. So rather than just a page saying, okay, this is the setup for the scenario and go, you get a lot of replayability with these scenarios because it's not going to be the same bot every single scenario. I thought that was very, very interesting. So those are the solitaire scenarios. And then we've got a bunch of two-player scenarios. And like I said, I, I'm going to harp on this quite a bit. I really love the fact that we have so many images and graphics to help you learn how to play Atlantic Chase. I really, really do appreciate that quite a bit. I have never seen GMT present rules like this before. Now, I'll be the first to admit I have not played 
every single GMT game that's ever been made, but I have not seen this kind of presentation before. So we've got a bunch of other player aids and things like that. I'll get to those in just a moment. But essentially what's going on here is you've got, especially if you're playing two players, you've got the British player or allied player, and you've got the German player. And one of the key concepts to this game are trajectories. And trajectories are represented by these little wooden segment pieces that you would be laying down. And essentially what you're doing is you are plotting the path of a task force. And we've got loads of different segment pieces here now this has no stripes on it we have some with one stripe two stripes three stripes so we've got a variety of different task forces that you can utilize and depending on the scenario you may have a lot of various different task forces that you're utilizing so what you're going to end up doing is you will have your ships you've got a task force display and as an example let's just say these Two cruisers are escorting a couple of convoy units. I, this doesn't represent a real scenario. I'm just kind of tossing that out there. So as you'll see, this is showing you which task force are we looking at. So this is showing us, okay, so just solid. Let's put it like down there. The solid is that task force. Just like the Germans, same thing. They utilize white. So, let's say we've got, just for the heck of it, we're going to plot like that. So, let's say that was the Sharn Horse and the Nisa now. So, this represents the trajectory for that task force. Now, these little segments are showing approximately how these task forces are going to travel. They don't indicate where exactly they are. So that is like the main concept of the game that people are introduced to is these trajectories are kind of you're plotting where you want these task forces to go. That does not necessarily mean that is where they're going to end up. So one of the things that you're going to do is you're going to actually be removing segments of this trajectory. And it's all going to be determined by the speed of the slowest ship that's part of that task force. So faster ships will complete the trajectories faster than slower ships. So as an example here, let's say that... Uh, here we've got very slow for the convoy with these cruisers protecting it. I'm going to move this stuff out of the way real quick. I'll zoom in and give you a better look at uh, some of the components as well. So what you're going to do is, let's say this is the trajectory that we have. And what's going on is, let's say this, this task force is actually trying to get to, uh, actually, let's do that. <laughs> There's no port there. Let's say they're going to Plymouth. So we've got very slow ships. So you're going to roll to see what kind of weather you've got. And assuming it's good, you actually have a table here that's going to tell you how many segments are you going to remove. One of the interesting things is you can remove segments from either end. So, of course, this is where you're trying to go. You're not going to remove it from here. But let's say you're, you're passing, you're finishing your turn handing initiative over to the other player and it's very slow let's say it's good weather you'd be removing two of the segments the shorter the trajectory the easier it's going to be for your opponent to track the specific location of your task force now once you reach the end of your trajectory and you remove the final segment you're going to actually place a cylinder. So as you notice here, 
it's showing the light brown cylinder or beige, whatever you want to call it. Once you remove that last segment, we're going to place a station. And that indicates that is where that task force is. Now, if you, say for an example, had ended a trajectory like so in the middle of the ocean, the next time you take a trajectory action, you can replace it and just start laying out a new trajectory just like so. So that's, a con that's like the big concept that people have to keep in mind is that you are not moving ships across a hex map. You are actually plotting trajectories for your task forces. And of course, the closer you end up to like enemy ports, you get intel, which makes it harder for the opponent to remove a lot of segments. So like for an example, very fast ships, or I should say fast ships, remove four segments from a trajectory so that they complete trajectories pretty quickly. But if you have intel on them, it makes it more difficult to remove the segments from the trajectory. Plus, there's also rules for, like for an example, we had it where we've got a trajectory intersecting here. So we have rules to see if we can engage, if we can engage that task force as well. Once again, the shorter it is, the easier it's going to be to try to find your opponent's task force. Move those out of the way. So what happens is if there is an engagement, then you're going to roll some dice and you're going to move to this little battle area here. And once again, if you're not using the advanced battle rules, it's pretty abstracted. And let's say it was uh, Scharnhorst and Nisenau. And then you're going to you're going to play up to three rounds of battle and all all that information is right down here. Gunnery, torpedoes and so on and so forth. With the ships and I'll zoom in, give you a better close, a closer look at the ship counters. Uh, they have gunnery ratings. They've got so many uh, damage points that will indicate when you flip them over to a damage side and from that damage side. How much how many hits they can take before they sink but the combat takes kind of a back seat to the cat and mouse game of the trajectories and intercepting your opponent uh there's all different stuff there's uh once again i should point out that this is the early years of the battle for the atlantic and i think the main reason it goes 1939 to 1942 is because 1943 on, it really, the ball was really in the Allies' court. So the Germans were at a major disadvantage outside of U boats. And even with U boats, they were having issues there as well. So I think the reason why it's these three years is mainly because it's, uh, it's a pretty even footing for both, for both sides. So you'll have various different scenarios that are going to have different objectives as well. Sometimes you might be, as the German player, trying to be commerce raiders, trying to, to sink shipping. As the allies, you might be running convoys and trying to protect the convoys, or you might be trying to intercept the raiders. Uh, there are German scenarios where the Germans are protecting convoys as well, uh, especially following Operation Barbarossa. There is a campaign game to this. There is loads and loads going on in Atlantic Chase. So a few other things I want to show you real quick is uh, like the player aids, which make life way easier. There are a couple of player aids here. Kind of giving you a breakdown. Once again, lots of illustrations as well. A lot of things going on have a number. Uh, and that is based on the bot telling you, okay, what the, what the bot is going to do. And everything's showing the number for what's going on as well. 
So we've got a couple of these. We also have a German force pool schedule. We've got a player aid for the advanced battle rules. I, I really love the fact that we've got like hit locations and things like that, bringing almost kind of like a, a miniatures game feel to the, to the battles here as well. We have extra maps. We've got the Norwegian Sea as well as the North Sea. For scenarios, uh, there are sh pretty short scenarios as well for that. And then we actually also have a, an errata sheet. I'm reaching over to get all this stuff. That's provided as well. Even with the tutorials and all the illustrations and everything else, this is still a complex game. I have to point that out. It because there's all the, there's all these other little rules going on, like uh, like a signal action and airstrike actions and and some some of the rules that you're not going to necessarily use every time. And then there's the different rules to the battles as well. Even though this is the standard battles, they're relatively abstract. But all in all, that's kind of a high-level look at Atlantic Chase. So let's swing on over to the other camera, and I will share some final thoughts as well as a review score. When I first cracked open the box for Atlantic Chase, I even mentioned it during the stream because I did a live unboxing. My eyes kind of bugged out. I was like, holy cow. And I can guarantee there have been a lot of people who have watched some of the how to play tutorials that are out there as well, who've been like, oh my gosh, I'm really intimidated by this. Don't be. Now, I'm not saying that Atlantic Chase is for everybody. I'll get to that in just a moment or two. But don't be thrown off by the number of rules and the rules complexity because if you follow through the tutorials and you play some of the solitaire scenarios, you will come to grips with Atlantic Chase. Once again, if you're going to play it as a two-player game, I really do recommend one player learns how to play and then loans the game out to the other player so they can learn how to play. You are not going to explain how to play Atlantic Chase in a short enough period of time to be able to start playing. And this is one of those games where if you explain it to somebody else, you're going to hit a snag, you're going to hit a point where you forgot to tell them something. And then they're going to be like, well, wait a second, you never told me that. Avoid that hassle. Just loan it out to somebody else. There is tons of replayability in Atlantic Chase, not only with it being solitaire and two players and having books for each filled with scenarios, each of the scenarios, especially the solitaire, for the bots, do different things. So it's not like you're, oh, I'm always rolling on table A to see what the British do in this situation. No, it's all different. Most of the scenarios have completely different tables on what's going on. Love that. I think it's very, very cool. Oh, actually, you know what? I completely forgot. Let me go back real quick. I'm going to zoom in so you can get a better look. Oops. All right, there we go. There we go. We focus. So I'm going to show you the ship. And I mean, there are loads of counters. You've got various informational counters as well. Just like so, just kind of give you an idea. But with the ships, it's going to show, remember I was talking about damage. So as an example, the Sharnhorst could take two hits before it's flipped over to its damage side. It's also a fast ship. We've got the gunnery numbers as well. Then we flip that over and now it's damaged. It becomes a slow ship. It could take three more hits before it's sunk. So that's one of the interesting aspects as well of this game is, remember, your trajectories, you're only going to be removing segments based on the slowest ship 
in the task force. Of course, you can create new task forces as well. You could split somebody off who's damaged, but then they're kind of a sitting duck. So very, very cool. I, I definitely like this. And as I mentioned before, you know, most people see these counters and they're like, oh, yeah. So it's like, okay, so what, movement two? Okay, two hexes. There are two hexes. It's like, no, that is, that is not how this plays out. But yeah, very, very cool. Very, very nice. And uh, there are loads of ships, loads of informational counters as well. Here we see these are the cruisers here that would take one hit to flip to its damage side and one hit to sink because these are only cruisers, whereas these are battle cruisers. The Nisa now and the Sharn Horse. All right, let's go back to the other camera. I just wanted to show those off because uh, I like it. I think it's pretty cool. I think it's pretty cool like that. Anyway, so a lot of people like to throw around words like revolutionary and innovative, and I've never played anything like this before when it comes to board games. I have never played anything like this before. This is a truly unique new design. Once again, it's not going to be for everybody. If you are into lighter warfare games, if you are into like more rules light, this is probably going to overwhelm people out there. This is not for people who are brand new to the hobby. Even with the hand-holding by the tutorials and everything else, I think there's so much going on that some people will be completely overwhelmed. That said, I think this is an awesome game for people out there who like a meteor war game experience. Now, granted, the abstraction to the combat, even with the advanced battle rules, may not be everybody's cup of tea either, but at least the advanced battle rules do put a little more meat on the bones of the combat as well. I thought this game is really, really well done. I got to admit that I think I'm playing it right. <laughs> so I think I've been doing all right with the rules playing it. But that's another aspect of this game as well that, Thankfully, the designer is on board Game Geek. They're online quite a bit. So they have kind of cleared up some misconceptions with some of the rules as well. Anyway, on a scale of 0 to 10, I give Atlantic Chase a very, very solid recommendation for people who like heavier war games. And I give it a 9 out of 10. I think it's that good. All right, that's it for this time out. If you like this video, by all means, please give it a quick thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. And if you do subscribe, ding that bell. It'll not only let you know when I upload videos such as this review, I'll also tell you when my live stream, The Gaming Gang Dispatch, airs right here on YouTube as I bring you the latest in tabletop gaming news and first looks at tabletop games. Of course, when you're not watching videos on The Gaming Gang channel, be sure to visit thegaminggang.com for all the latest in gaming news, reviews, and a whole lot more. You know the drill. Get your geek on at thegaminggang.com. Once again, I'm Jeff McAleer, and until next time, here's hoping you get to enjoy plenty of great gaming with your very own gang. Oh, you're still here. Well, while you're kicking it, how about subscribing to the Gaming Gang channel or seeing the latest episode of the Gaming Gang Dispatch for finding out what YouTube recommends you check out here at my channel. And of course, don't forget, get your geek on at thegaminggang.com.